Anyway, welcome. This is the uh, session to, to, um, uh, to recognize and honor uh, Professor Saskia Sassen uh, with the a AAG Honorary Geographer um, uh, Award. <laughs> um, I'd like to first of all introduce uh, Professor S uh, Sassen and then uh, uh, give her an award and then she's going to give us a, a, a short uh, uh, talk, uh, and then after that, she's open to, to questions uh, from, the, uh, from the floor as well. Um, it's, a, it's a real pleasure for me to introduce uh, Saskia. I actually nominated her to be the honorary geographer when I was the uh, uh, president of the AEG several years ago. You see how it takes a long time for these things to work their way through the AEG. Um, Saskia, of course, is, is extremely well-known, uh, world-famous for her writings uh, on globalization um, in all of its dimensions, really, in terms of, of everything from immigration to global cities uh, to, more recently, uh, her focus on the connections between uh, territory, uh, authority, um, and, um, and rights. Uh, she's currently the Robert S. Lind uh, Professor of Sociology at Columbia University and co-chair committee on global thought at Columbia um, and also a professor, centennial professor at the London School of Economics and Political Science and for many years uh, was on the faculty at the University of Chicago. P uh, possibly her three best known books are uh, the Mobility of Labor and Capital, which was published uh, in 1988. Uh, her, I think, most famous uh, book, uh, The Global City, which has been, uh, uh, been through two editions, first published in 1991 and then in 2001, and arguably she's uh, the inventor of the concept of the global city. And then uh, more uh, recently, in 2006, a book uh, that in many ways I think is the one that most justifies her appellation as, well actually more than an honorary geographer, uh, actually a real one, um, <laughs> called Territory uh, Authority uh, Rights uh, from Medieval to Global Assemblages. And that, uh, that appeared in 2006. And, and that work I think is uh, of absolute uh, importance and significance because it's a real uh, in my view, rethinking of our understandings of globalization, which typically uh, we've thought of in terms of the growth of some kind of global scale, you know, through um, organizations like the World Trade Organization or global financial markets and so on, somehow uh, operating in a, in a kind of realm uh, beyond uh, the national, beyond the local and so on. And as she argues in her book, Territory, Authority, and Rights, this may well be uh, one dynamic of globalization, but the other which she uh, has done most to, I think, articulate is constituted nationally uh, rather than in some kind of uh, 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 ethereal uh, global sphere uh, by institutions and actors that are embedded locally but oriented globally, such as networks of locally based activists following global agendas, Monetary and fiscal policies crucial for global markets, but made and enforced nationally and locally, and the spread of legal norms across international borders. So globalization, in this understanding, is a two-way street, originating in the policies and actions of at least some states, but continuing to be deeply intertwined with local and national sources of policies and actions. In some, and, and this is the, the vital point, I think, rather than being about replacing states, Globalization is about their destabilization and reorientation. So I think she's a truly uh, um, important uh, figure in the, in the study of the sociology of globalization, but even more in, in that, in the geographical uh, reformulation of globalization. And it's for that reason that I'm very proud today to present Saskia Sassen with the Honorary Geographer Award of the Association of American Geographers. I get to stand up. Yeah, yeah. I'll get out of your way. 
Well, um, this is really a great honor and also just pure enjoyment. Uh, for finally, it has been established officially that I'm actually not a geographer, just an honorary geographer. <laughs> Because people, or many people that I at least uh, am aware of, thought that I was a geographer. And um, uh, I, I, uh, I sort of stumbled upon geography uh, because it was the way for me to see, to understand. I'm only not a real, I'm also not a real sociologist, actually. Uh -huh. <laughs> so I dwell. Really, the two disciplines that, that, that have helped me the most, besides sociology a bit as a whole, huh? are uh, geography and law. And um, I feel totally at home. I don't feel like, let's say, an irregular immigrant in those fields. I actually, I'm a nomad, so I put down my tent when I visit geographic texts. And the same thing with law. It's, it's a wonderful feeling, by the way. I really recommend <laughs> for people to feel that way when they deal with other disciplines. Uh, so thank you. Thank you so much. And I wish there were a bit more comfort for you all in the back. Um, so I am going to talk rather briefly, 20 minutes or so, maybe half an hour. And then I am really looking forward to questions. Now, some of you may have noticed the title, Analytic Tactics, Geography as Obstacle. That is not a typo. That is what I meant. But obstacle is good in my book. I always tell my doctoral students also, find a tough wall, find an obstacle against which to work in terms of the subject you want to deal with. So my first experience of that was actually um, the question of gender. I am not a gender scholar, but no matter what question I was asking, including high finance, I would stumble upon the question of gender. And that is a bit how it went with geography for me, too. And that stumbling is a kind of obstacle. But out of that comes an interesting engagement, an interesting no, dialectic. No, 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 they need that. Now, what I want to do very briefly, I want to cover a lot of stuff, but very briefly. So I'm just going to throw myself into it. Um, I think of this time that we're living through, you know, the last 30 years, basically, as a time of unstable meanings. That is sort of a framing image that I have. I do not necessarily uh, uh, think of the term globalization. That is one particular instantiation. But what dominates for me is this notion that meanings that have gained a certain stability over a period of time, mind you, I think no meanings are permanently stable. But, you know, they gain a certain stability in certain efforts, in certain spaces and times. And um, I think that today, what we're seeing is the destabilizing of those meanings that had acquired a certain stability. So one of my new projects, for instance, by the way, I hear a bit of an echo. Can, is it good? Can you hear me like this? Yes, OK, good. That's better. Um, so for instance, one of my projects right now is the question of the social. Le social, lo social, you know what I mean? And not social as an adjective, but social as a, as a property, as a systemic condition, etc. And I think that this is a time when the social has become unstable. And so, so this is the way I'm thinking, and, and uh, geography has often helped me. Ah, here we go. <laughs> Multimedia entertainment. But um, so, so in su at such a time, I find that the question of method is a challenge. Method is a discipline. Method is a constraint. And we all need method. There's no doubt about that. But method also comes with assumptions and comes with constraints, and it leads you in a certain direction. I don't reject method. I need method. But I also find that confronted with meanings that become unstable, method will not necessarily help certainly not at the beginning of a project. So for instance, um, one, one of the, the so I, I talk about analytic tactics, right? And I mean it literally, a tactical move that allows you to position yourself vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis your object of study in a particular way that may not fit comfortably in any method. And that is the point of analytic tactics. Then at some point, you have to find your way back 
two methodological questions, you know, etc., etc. But a first step, a step of discovery, I'm always interested in discovering something. <laughs> Not simply replicating, proving, or disproving, but I think there is, we have all kinds of entertainment. Yeah. Uh, oh, I see they're freeing up space, check. Oh, I'm so glad. We're, we're humanizing the condition here for you. <laughs> I don't know how they're doing it, but they're moving walls, I don't know. But, um, Video and audio. Fantastic. Okay, so if you want video and audio you, and chair, you go there. <laughs> <laughs> but do not take your chair in that room. That would not, that's not the concept. So, so for instance, the global city, uh, John, that you brought up, right? When I was looking at the global city, I positioned myself at the center of a system. In other words, the center is an extreme condition. It's not the norm, it's not most of it, it's not the majority condition. In the current work that I'm doing on expulsions, which I will develop a bit, I'm positioning myself, ah, video I think, at the edge of the system. Now, I mean systemic edge, I don't mean geographic edge, this is not the geographic border, this is the systemic edge. That again is an extreme condition, and in the case of the of this expulsions work, one of the points that I'm making is that uh, I ask myself the question, when do we have to find other language than say, more inequality, more poverty, more etc., displaced people, more forced migrations, more hunger. And so that systemic edge is a kind of indicator. And I say we need other language. So I'm sort of working, this is really the beginning of a project with this category expulsions. And where I grew up, all these Latin countries, you know, uh, uh, Argentina, Italy, France, etc. expulsions is a mild word. Expulsions is what you do with the kid. Well, it's not so mild, I guess, for the little kid when he's expelled or she's expelled from school, you know. But it has a kind of domesticated meaning. It is not a meaning, it's not a dramatic meaning. You know, I don't know, in English, I can't quite wrap my brain around whether it is a domesticated sense of something or not. But I want to use a language that sounds, it belongs to us. It, so in that sense, it's domestic, it's a domestic word. In order to capture something that is, of course, uh, I consider extremely negative, extremely savage, I want purposefully to use a term. This is part of my analytic tactics. It's a provocation. You know, it's generating obstacles for the analysis that I'm doing. So I'm arguing that we're really witnessing today are expulsions. You know, when inequality reaches the levels that it reaches today, and the figures are astounding. I mean, just to give you a little, we, we all know the figures, but I just want to give you a concrete example. New York City. Now, New York City has always been a machine for making wealth. And inequality is part of that story. In 1980, the top 1% of earners, huh, not just capital income, but earners, got 12% of the income generated, the earnings huh, related to job generated in the city. Well, by 2009, the 2010 census, it was 44%. Are we still in the wrap of all the income generated in the city? You understand what I'm saying, right? So the question is, are we still in the realm of inequality? Does that language help us when we see that? Or another example, when up to seven million people are in prison at, or under some form of detention, it could be very temporary detention too in our country, in this, in this United States. Uh, is this just simply prison, you know, and I mean the whole world? Are we talking about something else? Are we warehousing people, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. Displaced people's camps in the global south. You see how the geography is beginning to enter here. I'm looking at various very acute instances. Uh, in the last year, in 2010, the last year for count, 10 million. This is a, I don't know. There are, it's not a round figure. You know, there are actually individual numbers in there. But over 10 million people were added to it formal official count, this is the humanitarian system of the UN, to the population of displaced people, where it had been at 30 million. In other words, in one year, we added an enormous amount of people. What is happening? And so I, I look at a whole set of issues, including the body, 
when the body is simply the source for extracting organs and the complex circuits through which those organs get then delivered, incorporated wherever they are going. Um, so I find myself, I who have long talked and done research about inequality, I find myself thinking that there is something else that is happening and the language of inequality is not enough. There is also inequality, but I think what we're seeing is a sort of expelling from the system. Now back to the systemic edge. Just, and again, this is analytic tactics, this is not method. So I argue, if I would have placed myself at the systemic edge of the Keynesian economy, you know, in many countries, including a country like Greece, by the way, um, I would have seen that the systemic uh, dynamic was to bring in people. Not because it was a nice system, but as consumers and as workers. Mass production, mass consumption, mass building of suburban space. People were critical, consumers were critical. If I position myself today in, at the edge, at the systemic edge, what I see is that the system, the tendency of the system is to expel. And these instances that I've been mentioning, and to that I add environmentally produced uh, forced migrations, etc., etc., asymmetric war, which is another way of expelling people from the civic space, uh, then I find that this image of expulsions helps me. It's a provocation. You know, it's, it's an exaggerated move, but it is a way, and in that sense I say it's an analytic, tactical move, if you want. And then I want to, of course, move back and, and give it a more, uh, a more social science-y kind of elaboration. But to me, this is extremely important. Now, a second type of, of move for me, and a second type of analytic tactic, is that confronted with a very powerful explanation. I don't reject it. I think a powerful explanation has reasons for being there as a powerful explanation. It does capture something. But the more powerful that explanation is, the more it represents a distilling of particular features and an evicting of all kinds of other things. So my first move, again, at a time of unstable meanings, is that confronted with a powerful explanation, I want to know what is it obscuring? What is it keeping me from seeing precisely because it is so powerful? So it is not rejected. Some of students say, oh yeah, yeah, let's do away with that explanation. No, that's a bit too easy. You know, you can't. You have, there are reasons why we have master categories. But I do think that when stabilized meanings become unstable, we need to sort of engage that power. And we need to look, if you want, at what is in the shadow or in the penumbra of these kinds of explanations. Now, for instance, the term urbanization, the famous phrase that I cannot, I cannot listen to it anymore. Most of the people in the world live, now live in cities. So for me, that is such a, a provocation that I want to go around. When you say urbanization, when you say city, when you say urban, that is a master category. It comes with so much content, with so much stuff, with, you know, people, it's an invitation to stop thinking. You, know, you say urbanization, you don't need to think about it anymore. And so I want to know, what is it keeping me from seeing? So I look in the penumbra around the cities. And so one of the elements, I mean, there are a whole set of issues, but one element for me is the whole story of land grabs. Uh, and when I'm, this is an sort of old story, you know, when, when King Leopold said, let me go buy some land, you know, he bought the Congo, and we know what happened next. But, but um, so, so this is an old story, and there is a very powerful explanation, which says a lot. Commodification of land, you know, fine. But that, precisely this whole issue of, you know, too powerful. But, so, so uh, I'm looking at the curve of growth. 206 to 2010, the best count that we have, because it's difficult to get to nail it all down, 70 million hectares of land were bought. The main buyers, not China. <laughs> China, China. Uh, Saudi Arabia, maybe not. No, uh, uh, financial firms, hedge funds. Uh, Morgan, J.P. Morgan bought 
tens of thousands of hectares of beautiful uh, fertile land in Ukraine, so did Goldman Sachs. Uh, in sub-Saharan Africa, it's hedge funds. Now, these people are not about to become farmers. That is not the concept that they're after. Uh, so my question then becomes, and of course, the, 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 let me just connect back to the urbanization bit before I say why this is happening. Uh, this, of course, means, let's go back to China. It's a good example to use, but I don't want to dump on China, all right? I don't want to clarify that. Anyhow, but I'm just illustrating. So when China buys 2.8 million hectares of land in Zambia and another 3 million in, uh, in Congo, to make it into a plantation, this is very important, plantation, for palm, for biofields, right? So what is a plantation? A plantation, you as geographers, I don't need to tell you, but you're evicting faunas, floras, villages, rural manufacturing districts, smallholder agriculture. And this is what I really now am interested in. Well, two things. One is where do those people go? Many of them are feeding that famous urbanization. This is just one little example. When you take mining, when you take the poisoning of land, either because of mono agriculture. So what I see in the shadow of urbanization is a whole set of issues that are not urban per se, but we've got to bring them in. Now, this is an example I think which is pretty clear, transparent, and communicates, or at least so I hope. Uh, it gets a bit messier you know, in, in, with issues and subjects that are not quite as self-evident. So, so I have a long list, but that's not possible to do that here. Now, I wanted to get at a second point, and this brings me to a third issue. So on to this third little point then. So I want to theorize that event, that evicting of people, villages, etc., faunas, floras, and this transformation of what is if you want. Now, now this is a bit concept, a conceptual move, all right? It's not an empirical that you say step by step, it's all there. Um, but in a way, one way of thinking about it is that it entails a transformation of what was, let's say, Zambian sovereign national territory into something else. When the chips are down, China, Zambia, go no, Chinese government, Zambian government, but also the materiality of it. It is now a stretch of land with no markers. After all, the presence of villages, the presence of smallholder agriculture, the presence of rural manufacturing districts sort of constitutes the territory. It, you know, it, it, it has links through legal issues, uh, customary issues with governmental issues, with the law, et cetera, et cetera. When you evict all of that and it just becomes land, in fact, you people are probably much better equipped to deal with this kind of question than I am. But anyhow, I am the one who's speaking, so <laughs> sorry, but <laughs> I apologize for my whatevers. But um, So I am interested in, in asking the question, and when you multiply these examples, when you add to that, which is one of the other subjects, the whole question of open mining, the kind of devastations that that produces, you know, I mean. Um, so I, I'm sort of developing a, a little bit of a hypothesis for research, which is that part of this con contemporary global era is marked by sort of, if you want, structural holes. Holes as in agujero, that's what Spanish, I don't know how many of you know, that's a great word. It must be Arab word, agujero, it sounds strange. Anyhow, holes, not holes with W, but holes with H. Huh? Holes, structural holes in the tissue of national sovereign territory. And I, I just had the honor to do the, the stores lectures in, um, uh, oh God, it's a grand title, in Jurisprudence and Philosophy. I don't belong to either one of those two disciplines, but anyhow. And you get to, to give two or three uh, lectures. This was at the Yale Law School. And so I talked about this new project. You know, in one lecture, I talked about this notion of these structural holes. And what that means in terms of the question of territory, national sovereign territory, and, uh, and what it means, for instance, to explain the ascendance of certain possibilities uh, including the rise of organized religions in a context of a hundred year history of a secularizing, of a state with secularizing capacities over national territory. So I'm really interested in also seeing this issue of land, the buying of land and the destruction of land through these broader lenses of a shift in the, in this, in this, the, the character of national sovereign territory 
the capturing the historicity of that period, which has become the emblematic period, I know not in your work, but you know, for political scientists, let's say. Oh, we can dump on those who are not here. So for political scientists, though probably some other disciplines also are guilty of that. Um, and, and so how, how do we liberate the category? On the one hand, how do we relate to these structural holes? But secondly, and this would be a fourth point now, uh, how do we liberate such a powerful category as territory from that particular ensconcing in you know, the 100 years, especially the 20th century, I would say, uh, but already beginning in some cases earlier, of this, this, this flattening of the category territory into national sovereign territory. And of course, territory is not land, it's not ground, it's not space, it's not physical terrain. It is a, it is a complex category with multiple embedded logics of power, embedded logics of claim making. So back to the Zambia and Congo example, when I say that from territory it goes to something else far more elementary like land, besides the commodification question that is the most typical uh, explanation, uh, there is also an issue of, um, you know, it is no longer territory. It has, the, and, and then the possibility is no longer Zambian territory with that, with the citizenship, uh, the, the, the right to make claims, et cetera, that come with it. Not that practically speaking they get to do that, you know, the Zambian people, but still. Um, and so I wonder also there, is a new territory being made when China occupies it that way? <laughs> You see where I'm getting, my final point is about Occupy. Um, Occupy was it. So when China occupies that territory, evicts all the markers that constitute it in a way as Zambian territory, and you're left with land growing pom, 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 you know, this homogeneous thing, is there another kind of beginning of the making of a territory where China has, is making the markers, is constituting a law, is embedding a logic of power and a logic of claim making, whatever that might be, it could be vis-a-vis -vis the Zambian government, in fact. You know, these are the kinds of questions that I'm really interested in. And uh, so the final point that I, because I do want to begin to wrap it up, um, is I've been totally engaged by this question of occupying Wall Street. Uh, it started with Tahrir Square, etc. And so there are two elements, analytic elements, and again, sort of analytic tactics that I'm uh, working with. Uh, one of them is this question that occupying is different from demonstrating. Uh, and, I'm, and Occupy Wall Street is this extraordinary case where I think of Wall Street, which is a bit of an emblematic huh, term here, not a descriptive uh, term. Wall Street is the territory of global finance, one of the territories of global finance. It has embedded logics of claim making, you know, which the power of the financial uh, uh, firms makes clear. Um, and when the occupiers go and occupy Zuccotti Park, that's a meaningful, that's very different from demonstrating. They have, they made a territory in Zuccotti Park. They embedded other logics for claim making and for contestation uh, in Zuccotti Park. And that in a way also makes it sort of, there is a kind of infrastructural sense or something infra, huh? not fully developed, not fully articulated, of a threat to this other territory. So I'm talking also about recovering the notion of territory, not just, and not just collapse it all into national sovereign territory. Now, th that has a complicated connection with my expulsions work, uh, which I cannot get into now, but I just want to say that that uh, this to me is extremely exciting to, to revisit that category territory. And this has been one of the key uh, obstacles in my work in the sense that when I was dealing with high finance, that is how I arrived at the global city uh, uh, issue, you know, I was also dealing with digital space electronic networks, but there kept appearing this territorial moment that had meaning and, the, and then the global city as a space that is neither fully national nor fully global, it is a distinct territory. It's a partial territory, but it is a distinct territory. It is one of these structural holes at the limit in the tissue of national sovereign territory. But further, this political function that I always, always, always talked about, which was that the global city was not just the space for the, for the project of global finance, it was also the space for the, min, the minoritized, whether immigrants, whether 
uh, uh, you know, native, I mean, citizens, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I'm sort of thinking now, revisiting some of that through this lens of territory, which I did not quite do in the in the global city. In the global city it was more a physical space, a physical terrain, if you want. Um, final point on the global street. I, well, I, I I came up with this term just just to find a short term. Uh, global Street, and Global Street is not necessarily an actual street. Some of you may have seen the little bits that I wrote. And so I, I found myself connecting again with an old subject for me, and so I think of the Global Street as a space where those without access to the formal instruments of power get to make a bit of history, a bit of the political, and also I think the social. I am really interested in who makes the social today. So the global street is, um, and I, then I juxtapose it, <clears throat> for those of you who are urbanists, um, uh, with the piazza, the sort of in the European imaginary, you know, the making of the public. So I sort of, you have, if you want, the piazza, a space for regularized, for ritualized routines, which makes the public. And that includes the center of a city Lots of traffic, you know, high rush hour. We bump into each other. We step on each other's feet. We whatever. We even break something, you know. But there is a code. And the code is this is not a personal attack. The same stuff, the same activity, the same bumping or in the neighborhood could become, you know, a sense of being offended. So what is it? What urban capability are we talking about when, we're, when we are detecting this sort of is what, what in international law you would call comedy. You know, a sort of a deference, an indifferent, deference, indifference, very nice, two, two very nice words juxtaposed. You know, but it's a code. It's a code that is embedded in a kind of urban space, the center of the city where it's all crowded. And so, so that's sort of the ritualized, that's a ritualized space. And then I'm thinking of the space of making, and there comes the global street. So both of these constitute the public uh, as an abstract sort of condition. But they do it in very different ways. And in that sense, this the, the, coming back to my original, my starting point, this notion that this is a time when stabilized meanings are becoming unstable. And hence also the global street then, or that space where those who lack access to the formal instruments of power make space, make the public, constitute a public. Uh, that sort of, to me, then sort of hangs all together very, very nicely. Now, I want to um, to end up with, um, well, I think I've sort of said it all. <laughs> that I guess the final, the final element, uh, and that will reconnect again with a with a concern in geography that I've had, is a, is a question that is connected to what I just said, and I owe. I mean, I've been asking myself this question for 20 or 30 years, and that is the question whether the powerless make history. And in my territory book, I really try to address that question. I try to understand, do they make history? And I think that they make history. They Not always, eh? but they can make history. But there is a different temporality that attaches to it. And, um, and it can take many generations. And so the challenge, again, back to this... Um, back to this question, powerful explanation, etc. It, it, it is a making that is easily rendered invisible. Even when there are actual outcomes, the, the actors are rendered invisible. So I think of the global street also a space that actually makes visible. There is a spatial quality that I'm capturing. The same crowd in a farm, in a California farm, of undocumented immigrants, if you want, can stand there with a sign saying, I have the right to have rights, but nothing happens. The same people, exactly the same people in a different space, space of the city, complex uh, city, you know, very mixed elements, etc. They are actually, something is happening, they're making presence to each other, to others, etc. And in that sense, the, the, the space of the city as a space where the powerless can make a history, a public, the global street, the uprisings being one very, very sharp instance. Um, and, uh, and you know, there is, a, there, is a, there is an ephemeral quality, perhaps, to that. 
But when you think of how did the Soviet Union come down? How did formalized systems come down? The dictate the murderous dictatorships in Latin America. It was not because there was a bigger power that brought them down. There was something else. And World War II, it was indeed a stronger power that brought the evil side down, if you want. But, but um, so what is it? Well, in the Soviet Union, one part of it was millions of people started to walk, to bike, to drive cars. Hungary was critical, let them pass. Austria, critical, opened the borders. In the military dictatorship of Latin America, all kinds sort of an implosion of power. So there is some kind of making of the, by the powerless of a history, of a possibility that is invisible to our categories. And in that sense, the global street for me is sort of an element, a space. It really is a space that can make that visible. All right, that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs>